Welcome back to Horns High Studios for another episode of 666 Seconds of Murder. That means each one of these videos is less than 666 seconds or 11 minutes and 6 seconds. So no time to waste. Let's get right to it. But before we do, don't forget to hit that like button. Drop a comment below so this video gets out there to more people just like you. And if you're not a subscriber, please consider doing that before you leave today. It helps the channel grow. It doesn't cost you anything, and I sure appreciate that. Now, it's important to remember that this video is for informational purposes only. These are just my opinions and speculation. I'm not an expert. I'm just using some good common sense to analyze this case. I'm not saying anyone is guilty of anything, and all of what I say is alleged. Now, for this episode, I'd like to discuss the Idaho 4 case in an article that came out a year ago from The Independent on May 24th of 2023. It was entitled, Brian Koberger's sister searched his car before police swooped in by Rachel Sharp. And I'll link to that article in the description so you can read it for yourself. Now, she says sources sold, told NBC's Dateline this information that was used for the article. So I got to say a little suspicious the way this article is written. Now, first of all, we've seen that the mainstream media do the best they can to circle the wagons when it comes to the prosecution, who has been just floundering around lately like they just graduated from law school a month ago. We saw that Ashlyn Couch interview last week and how she brought up the social media violence as the theme for this new charity she created for Kaylee and Maddie, a scholarship in their name. And I wondered if that was why NBC News had a desire to kind of push that narrative about Brian Koberger was stalking these victims. Kind of a roundabout way to do it, but that's the same old tired story that was debunked weeks ago by Bill Thompson himself. One more time, there was no stalking of these victims when it comes to Brian Koberger. And without that, I'm sorry, there's no motive that I can see here at all. Now, I'll tell you what, if Bill Thompson wants to keep beating that drum, Maybe he should have spent more time over at the Sigma Chi house finding out just how obsessed David Loach was with Xana. Or maybe finding out exactly what Jack DeCour thought of Kaylee moving away and taking the dog with her and leaving him behind. What about Maddie's boyfriend, Jake Schreiger, who was only 90 minutes away in Coeur d'Alene at the time? David Loach, Jack D, and Jake Schreiger all had more motive, means, and opportunity to do this than Brian Koberger. That's for sure. So I wondered if this article about Brian Koberger's sisters was a well-timed hit piece to make Brian look so guilty that his own flesh and blood would have turned him in. I mean, minus the knife sticking out of his back, He's another Julius Caesar in this story, if this is true. Now, according to the article, the two sisters were voicing their concerns about Brian and wondering if he could have been involved with the crimes back in Moscow. They were all gathered at the Koberger family home in Albrightsville, Pennsylvania for Christmas. The article talks about one sister in particular, but doesn't say which one. He had two sisters. He was the youngest of the three. Now, Melissa Koberger was working as a mental health therapist at the time in New Jersey when these crimes happened. And I read in this article and heard about this many times that she lost her job because of Brian's arrest. Now, I don't know where she was working, but I honestly don't know how somebody gets fired because their brother was arrested. That doesn't make a whole lot of sense to me, but that's what she claims. Now, the other sister, Amanda Koberger, was an actress 
who also claims that she lost her job over this, but we're not sure what exactly that was. That even makes less sense to me than Melissa. She was an actress in some cheesy horror film called Two Days Back in 2011, according to IMDb. Ironically, the movie is about a group of young people who get hacked up with knives and hatchets. I'm surprised none of the guilters are citing this movie as Brian's inspiration. Probably shouldn't give him any ideas, right? Now, Melissa Koberger apparently wrote a poem about the crimes that shortly before her brother was arrested. Also very strange. So many strange things in this case, right? The article goes on to say that the sisters met with the other members of the family and they searched Brian's car for evidence. They also mentioned that he was cleaning his car with bleach and that he wore gloves constantly around the house. Apparently, though, the father sided with Brian, said he didn't think he was involved, but the sisters really believed that he was and contacted the authorities. It was the following night that the authorities swept in and raided the Koberger home and arrested Brian. Now, first off, we know that Ann Taylor has said there were no signs that Brian used anything like bleach to clean his car. So that makes me think this article could be bogus. As for the gloves around the house, yeah, that's odd. But the pandemic made a lot of people germaphobes, so we don't know if that's the case here. I'm not saying that that's what happened. I really don't know. I have not seen any pictures of him walking around the house with gloves on. Now, we heard this same stuff from the Monroe County, P, uh, Pennsylvania District Attorney, Mike Mancuso, who was the point man for the Brian Koberger elaborate arrest at the home in Albrightsville. He said that they found Brian up in the middle of the night in gloves going through the family garbage and separating his out. Now, this never made any sense to me whatsoever. Why would Brian do this in his family's home where anyone under the roof would have been traced back to him? I mean, it just makes zero sense why he would be separating his garbage, at least not for that reason. I mean, he would know this. Of all people, he would know this. I mean, anyone who follows true crime knows this. I mean, I always thought that was BS. And I also have heard that Mike Mancuso has some of his own drama, some of his own baggage over there in Pennsylvania. And his wife is a judge, and she was asked to resign due to conflicts of interest with him. So who knows? Who knows? Now, the article goes on to talk about Brian's DNA on the sheath, like he bled all over the, every inch of the thing. No mention whatsoever about the frailty of touch DNA. A few skin cells. That's it. Again, that's why I think this article was meant to further cement that negative image of Brian Koberger. I mean, that's what most people think of when they think of Brian Koberger. DNA on the sheath. He's the guy that did it. Creepy, weird, incel. We've heard it all. But that's my take on this article. I mean, you guys can check it out. Like I said, I'll link to it down below. Let me know what you think about it. Now, don't miss my live today. That's Sunday, May 19th from 4 p.m. to 6 p.m. Central. I'm going to be talking Idaho 4 once again, hoping you guys are there to join the conversation. I'm going to be with Michael Adario for that. It's going to be awesome. He's the guy behind the Blowing Up Idaho 4 video series, getting into parallel construction, Stingray technology, really fascinating stuff and how it pertains to the Idaho 4. So you definitely don't want to miss that. Comment below with your thoughts. Love to hear what you guys have to say about this one. I do want to thank my friends at the Horns High Club. You guys are amazing. I really appreciate your support. 
I'm glad that you guys like that perk of getting the videos as soon as I upload them instead of waiting for them to come out. And I appreciate all of you guys that watch these videos with me. And we'll see you next time for another episode of 666 Seconds of Murder.